Welcome to Glow and Tell, a podcast about all things beauty, wellness, and business, sponsored by Artemis, the brand empowering the unsung heroes of beauty and wellness. Welcome back, listeners, to another episode of Glow and Tell. I'm so excited to be here with you all today, as well as be here with Stacey Krizan, the owner of Cryo Contouring Studios, as well as the founder of Krizan Consulting, and someone who I personally admire a lot, and I'm just really excited to have on the podcast today with us. Stacey, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Looking forward to it. So I wanted to start off with just a little bit of information for our listeners about your background, um, as much or as little as you'd like to share, but I uh, always lean towards hearing a little bit more because I think it's always so interesting to understand how people come to this industry in terms of evolving into beauty and wellness and how their jobs, careers, lives, paths have changed and wound um, kind of on that journey. So if you just want to give us a little bit of background about you, your experience in career and in life, and we can kick it off from there. Sure. So where do you begin as you approach half a decade, a half a century old, right? <laughs> um, so um, when I was growing up, I've always wanted to be, you know, if you ask my grandmother, who's looking down, wondering what I'm doing these days, I told her I wanted to be a hairstylist. Ironically, when I was a little bitty, a girl, that's the thing I just wanted to be. And her response to me back then was, oh, some, you're going to be on your feet all day. And some clients are not going to like the, what you do and you might get, you know, Mm. sensitive or You know, and I was like, and something about that stuck with me, you know, A, it matters what people think, B, do I want to stand and serve all day, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, And they kind of went in and out, you know, my my family was probably very middle class, working hard, struggling, and my mom was, you know, a corporate executive, breaking glass ceilings, and um, having grown up in that environment, it was just always such high expectations, right? Right. Right. So when I was set to go to college, um, there was like the top majors published. And I'm like, all right, if I'm going to college, I probably want to get a job. (laughs) It's a good good goal to aspire to, I think, going into university, right? That's what we all hope hope for and and dream for. Right. Well, Delaney, I don't know. I have a college, uh, I have a kid approaching college and, and their perspective is very different than us, like... 30 years ago, right? Um, So anyway, I was looking at this list and I was like, all right, if I'm going to college, I need, and just think it forward. I want to have a job in four, five years. Um, I'd like it to be worth my time. And so I went down the top salary and on the very top was chemical engineering. And that's how I chose my major. I was like, all right, the top job placement out of college with a bachelor of science is chemical engineering with the highest starting salary. Mm-hmm. And I was like, Ooh, that's a stretch. I'm pretty good in math if I work hard. And that's how I ended up, you know, pursuing my degree. Um, it's interesting. Cause you know, I guess when I think back now, so many years later, I look back as, as like the, the, the choices I've made, I think I've always had this sense of wanting to be in a room of people smarter than me, wanting Mm -hmm. to always surround myself where I can, you know, learn. Um, But it also presented a lot of challenges. I always was in an environment where I'm constantly learning and Mm -hmm. I'm never the smartest. Mm -hmm. And I'm always just so humbled by the people. And it really defines like probably my trajectory of just like being a constant learner, always surrounded by smarter people. And always kind of acting like, hmm, maybe that's a good idea, but yet not confident enough to be the smart person in the room, mm, right? Interesting. So um, going to college, you know, I enjoyed um, college years and struggled a bit. Um, I definitely stretched myself with the degree, probably barely graduated, to be perfectly honest, um, in the aspect of just all of my colleagues were hit in the lab. They were straight A students. And I was like, probably the one that was finding the middle of like, let's have fun, but let's excel and meet the minimum requirement to get to the job. 
Right. Yeah. So at any rate, after college, I did end up getting a couple of offers and it was back in New Jersey in the pharmaceutical industry. And it was just ironic because, and this is a lesson I tell my kids is I didn't have the best GPA, but I had the most job offers. And the reason is the degree got me in the door. And then my, mm. then your conversation gets you the job. A hundred percent. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think that that's something that's so important too for our listeners, whether they be professionals or entrepreneurs, um, you know, obviously coming from such a diverse backgrounds that it's just getting your foot in the door. It's getting the conversation. It's saying yes to the opportunities to have the conversation. It's knowing that no conversation is too insignificant or too small that, you know, whenever we can network with people and, and get in front of people that it provides us with such golden opportunity. And so where did you kind of move through, you know, in pharmaceutical, you were, did you start in pharmaceutical sales or were you in the chemical engineering side of things? Yeah. So I started as a process engineer for a biotech company in New Jersey. And there, my job was to travel to the manufacturing facility and build and expand a facility. So to go from like a facility that did tabletling, tabletling to a facility that did it for the entire company and become a center of excellence, where instead of it being a one, one type of pill or prescription, it mm. would be tabletling for all the entire um, franchise or the company. And it was the, I would say the the moment that I knew I was in the wrong side of the table was when I was sitting there and we're talking about like the color of the prescription medications. And we're talking about products that are 10 years down the pipeline or um, products that are in develop or in manufacturing, but yet the, the lead times on the device to build are longer than mm -hmm. we can meet the demand. And the conversation from the brand management was like, do you think we can change the color or if we did it in this color, we'd get it out faster. If we changed the shape or we did, and there was like this conversation that we were having as a team mm -hmm. and it was like, no, people have been taking this for, we can't like get rid of this medication because the people that are taking it need this and they are so brand loyal. And I was like, the, the small ma decisions make such a significant impact. I'm like, I want to be on the opposite side of the table. I want to know why people are making these decisions and mm. what the customer is emotionally attached to or how it's helping them. And so that's when I was like, all right, when this project is done, so it was like a two-year project, um, I'm going to move and go to the other side of the table. How do I get into brand management? So as a, most people that go into marketing and pharmaceuticals, they have a degree in communications. They have a mm. degree in MBA in marketing. And here I am with a chemical engineer degree where nobody as an engineer is good with people. They're certainly not going to be able to go out and hit the streets and sell something. So I had to go out and like meet people that were mm. in the decision-making power of hiring a salesperson that might have potential. And that is how I got um, into the marketing. So I went through the sales avenue and then went into brand management through different companies. And, um, and that's really, so like when I see how much the pharmaceutical engineer has changed or how much it's, it has an impact on people, that's probably where I learned all of my professional abilities from like supply chain, P and L, um, brand management, sales, communication, you get to see the whole gamut. Um, but I had a goal. Like I, you know, I went to college for the goal of getting a mm. job. Um, after I got the job and I met my now husband of 20 years, we're like, all right, it's time to start a family. And so when I was thinking about all that, I'm like, all right, I have this like accelerated plan of when my life should start. So I was like, all right, graduated college. I think everybody at my age at that time had these sort of like milestones. I think the milestones are so different these days. Um, I was like, all right, by the time I hit 30, I'm going to get married and have, be pregnant like shortly after I'm going to start a family. And in order for me to do have a family and be flexible, I need to make six figures before this certain time period. So that way I can like leave the career fields kind of like at its peak. And then I can return when I'm ready. Right. And then life happens, you know, you just set these goals and um, then you have children. So that's kind of, you know, and then you just find yourself juggling and trying to be, you pretend you work, but you're really a mom. Right. And it's a full-time job. So how did you map out your career journey around that? You know, wanting, knowing that you wanted to 
be there for them when they are in now this teenage space. But I also know, and our viewers maybe mm -hmm. don't know yet that you're such an entrepreneur and you are so busy and you have so much am amazing work going on. So how did you, how did you manage that? How did you plan for that? So um, I decided that I was going to go back to the workforce and I literally only had this criteria before it was like money, development time periods. Then this time I was like, I just want to get out of the house, take a shower, ha have coffee talk about something that's not involving baseball or soccer or coaches or this. Um, and I literally was like, I don't even want to make a lot of money. I just want to like get out. Right. The, the environment was, I just want to be in the environment that was stimulating. Right. And it was, a, it was difficult because the work that was available for something like that was just not even worth being out. You know, it really wasn't. So, you know, it just wasn't. So then, you know, you end up in this predicament. I'm sure many working moms like, all right, in order for me to make my time worthwhile, it's going to be a big job. And then that's a big sacrifice. So I was, you know, it was going to require getting on the road and traveling again. And, um having a pretty big responsibility. And that's when my sister-in-law, ironically, was working with the founder of this company and was like, you should check this company out. And she just invited me as just a sister to come be part of one of her events. So I literally was, like I joke with my friends, I'm like, I was a, I was a model of arm slimming for this non-invasive thing. I don't even know what I was doing. I'm not, you know, I was just like, sure, I'll get out. You want me to, you want my arms or my belly in the city one day? Right. And so for me out here in the suburbs of New Jersey, going into the city, this is a big event. I'm like, had a, a bunch of logistics that I had planned. My girlfriend and I were both, I'm like, I recruited somebody. We can do this together. And on the way home, I was like, we both looked at each other and we're like, we could totally do this. Let's call your sister and find out how much those devices are. We could sell this in New Jersey. Right. So I get on the phone. I'm like, Hey, Molly, how much are those devices? I think I can, I have lots of friends. I know people that want this. This is so funny. It's just so 360. So um, she told me the price. And I was like, oh, you know what? I'm, I, I think I'll, I'll continue on with my corporate recruiting jobs. Um, and then there was a change or somebody had left and there was an opportunity in the sales department. Mm -hmm. And it sounded something like this. This is my conversation at home was, so there's this job. You work from home. It's low paying with probably some like great potential and, um, but you work from your computer and I'm like, I'm like, we're not doing that. And my husband's like, <laughs> I was like, cause this is the opposite of what I was looking for. I'm like, I'm looking for a job that I can just check in, smile, have conversation and just go home to my family, not carry any kind of burdens. I don't right. want somebody else's P and L on my head. And my husband's like, you could still, you could do that. Like you used to be in pharmaceutical sales. You could go mm -hmm. sell these devices mm -hmm. and you could do it from home in between the kids. And I'm like, he had I'm it all messed out for you. He had it all planned out. <laughs> it's so it's, it's, it's really great. You know, I mean, I guess in retrospect, he knew I could. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, and so that is how I met Simon. So I ended up interviewing with him. Um, and then I just, you know, I think I was probably one of Simon's most challenging first and like first onboardings because I came from pharmaceuticals where everything was a prospective study head to head for claims. Claims were very specific. They were real. They were meaningful, set out parameters and the lead times were so, so when I come here and I'm learning about non-invasive contouring and it's in this space where people are feeling good looking good but they actually feel great because the treatments are great and there's there's, there's studies but it's not the same rigor as something that mm -hmm. might treat cancer or right. treat cardiovascular disease it's just it's not necessary because you're not doing any you're not in, you know you're not doing anything so adverse right so um so it was a little bit of a religion change at the beginning i love that framework
because I do actually think that in this industry, both beauty and in wellness, that there are a lot of people that have come to this industry from more traditional corporate pharmaceuticals, whether it's on the sales side, on the engineering side, marketing, wherever it might be. And I do find that in my conversations with people, it really is this huge paradigm shift that you have to almost re-engage the way your mind is working to be able to really enter the, the industry successfully. But you're also bringing this vast amount of, to your point, rigor to an industry that, you know, unfortunately, and I've talked about this on previous episodes, it's the beauty and wellness space is, is definitely a space that there's, there is snake oil in our industry. It is something that we are constantly as professionals in this space, as entrepreneurs in this space, having to kind of battle against and really prove ourselves and prove the efficacy of, of the work that we do, the treatments that we offer, um, which is, you know, something that at Artemis is so, so important to us from that kind of clinical efficacy standpoint and really making sure that these are tried, true, tested, but also very safe. Um, so yeah, no, I love that perspective of, of a change in religion. It makes me think of um of rem <laughs> we're dating ourselves um to that point though i i do believe that it doesn't take much to differentiate yourself in this industry because if you have the same level of ethics and mm -hmm. um quality as you have in other industries it's so apparent yeah so i i think that you know instead of getting focused getting distracted by the background noise. It's so much easier just to stay your course and it you really just stay above. Absolutely. Could not agree more. And so once you joined Artemis as a salesperson, tell me about that journey. Tell me about the journey since then. You know, I know that you moved through, you know, many roles, had many hats at Artemis, um, but since then have really been able to create this dream life, this dream career for yourself that feels incredibly fulfilling. And it really shows on you. You know, I saw you not too long ago and I was just blown away by what you've been able to accomplish in such a short amount of time. So I know our, our listeners and our viewers are likely really eager to hear about you know, that path? How, how did you get there? How did you create that for yourself? I'm sure that there were some bumps along the road, which we would love to hear about as well, given that we like to tell secrets here, <laughs> spill these untold truths. Um, but yeah, if you want to share a little bit more about your journey from Artemis and beyond. So when, when Simon and um, the team at Artemis hired me, it was, a, it was kind of an infant business, right? Mm -hmm. It was an infant industry. It was a brand new um, startup. And I think Simon hired me as a person, not for the role, you mm -hmm. know, because if he were to hire me for that specific role, he probably would tell you I wasn't fit. Like, this <clears> is not something I really wanted. Um, I I could see maybe the potential of some other perks like development, startup, flexibility. Um, but if you look at just the function, and the reason I'm pointing this out is because I, when, when I saw um, at the last event for Artemis at the um, skin analysis event, um, I had the conversation around hire people who are driven to your mission and then mm -hmm. find a role for them. And so I, you know, looking back, I think Simon, saw me as a human being and my experience and my potential and said, all right, the position we have is sales and I'm going to help her be a great salesperson. Um, but she's certainly not one today, right? For whatever um, that role was at that time. And I think that's really important. I see that's a mistake in the industry today. Like I, if you go on Indeed or you go in LinkedIn and they're looking for specific skills and they're like, mm -hmm. all right, I'm looking for somebody to, that is a technician of A, B, and C that is willing to work from nine to five. And instead, if they said, I'm looking for somebody who's driven by this mission and then has this type of passion, then you know what? I'll find you a job in our, I'll find mm. a role that fits you. And I think that that having gone through the onboarding and having grown with Artemis, having seen different, you know, evolutions of their business grow, mm -hmm. having, you know, we like grew big, we expanded in different areas, we added different devices, we added different service levels. And the, that expansion just makes everybody in the team wear different hats. Mm -hmm. And so it doesn't even matter what my title was, honestly. It was like, at the end of the day, we all had this mission. Right. And 
and your role just meant to get to the mission. And today you're a customer success. Tomorrow you're um, business development. The next day, it, it really didn't matter. Um, and so Artemis was, I would say Artemis really flourished during, you know, kind of like the unsung hero during the pandemic. And although we get a lot of pushback, I think it was almost like our brand positioning or value prop was meant for it. We were a high um, value opportunity, mm -hmm. but yet you could divorce us quickly because mm -hmm. if you didn't have to make this large investment. And so during pandemic, we all shifted to like make that true to our, to our partners um, rather than like doing what other companies would do and just make you stay with it. You know, we had it, you know, it, it did eat, eat at our operating costs for some time, but I do believe that it lended to like really differentiate our brand. It's been almost, it's been like just over an exact year. I had now been in this function um, where I was kind of, you know, my goal was always to help partners be successful because at the end of the day, our clients, if they're successful, they keep coming back to us, right? It doesn't matter if they're buying our device or if they're, you know, buying our products or they're, you know, attending our events. At the end mm -hmm. of the day, their success is our business, right? 100%. And I realized that I had this, like, um, I want to say, like, unique opportunity where I sat on both sides of the fence, right? I used mm -hmm. to be in big corporate America. Then I was in a small, you know, small startup and got to wear so many different hats. And then I'm consulting companies just because I care and all these businesses that actually follow some of my advice would call me back and say, oh my gosh, Stacy, it was you that gave me that idea and I mm -hmm. executed it. And then I added this and I did this. And to hear that feedback and then also partner with some partners to like help them grow. Um, I'm like, you know what? I think I can help. I think I can be of great value to a lot of people if I only focus on this. Mm -hmm. So instead, and that was really hard because... I, you know, you want to be a good employee, but at the same point, I'm like, I see this, like the small sliver opportunity that if I just like take it out further, I can have a greater impact on more people. Mm. So that's when I was like, all right, I'm going to just go out there and just solely help people that are interested in growing faster mm -hmm. with less frustration, mm -hmm. um, be successful in running these types of businesses. And, um, and I was very specific about that. Like people that want to be successful, that want to do it in a fast approach, and they don't want to throw a ton of energy and frustration. And, and that was my positioning right from the start. So that doesn't mean like brand new people that are right. bright eyed and bushy tailed and they want soup to nuts, the recipe. That's not my, you can go to somebody else for that. Mm -hmm. And so it really, it really lends itself. And I think that's also you know, focusing on your target audience, aligning your value and your brand position, and then creating that curated experience that completely resonates with that audience. And that's what we do every single day in my treatment business. So when I resigned and I said to um, the, the leadership at Artemis, I'm like, you know what, I think I have a calling and I think it's going to help you because I'm going to go out there, take your opportunity more into the, you know, into the um, trenches and help people that want my services. Mm -hmm. And it was probably about a month in, I was like, you know what? You, they really need somebody who speaks their language. Because for me to say what to do is like just part of the game. Like, it's just like, it's a teaser for them. They're like, all right, well, if you're going to tell me to do that, like, how do I actually do that? And so either then you end up being a consultant and doing their services for them. So I decided that I would show them by literally just opening up my own place and doing exactly what I would recommend if I were a partner starting. Which is such an incredible trajectory. I feel that you really were able to kind of take these different facets of this very particular niche in the industry, right? This idea of opening up this wellness and beauty business and you 
we're able to come at it from this more, you know, kind of business perspective of this distribution company and helping with partner success in that capacity, then also having the, you know, experience of being just a consumer yourself of these types of services. So having that side of things as well, to then going in and consulting for these businesses to help make them more successful and to have the confidence to then go out and say, not only am I going to keep my consulting business and I'm going to keep running it successfully, keep helping others to be successful as well. But I'm also going to start my own business so that I can have my own proof of concept, right? Which is, I think, something that lends incredible credibility to what you do. And I'm sure is something that's also, you know, kind of catapulted your consulting business. How have you seen it grow or change or seen your dynamic with your clients change as a result of having that business and, and being in their shoes? Um, I would say two things. One, I'm able to better value my time, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm able to say things like, you're not ready for me. I'm not interested. Um, and those are significant because like a lot of consultants and a lot of salespeople and business people, they want all the business, right? They want to help everybody. Right. Partly because they're afraid that the business won't come tomorrow if I don't take this today. Sure. But for the same reasons that you create a brand, you also have to create that same brand in all of your aspects. So, mm -hmm. you know, I can't help a brand. I can't help a brand new person. That's not sure what type of business they should be in to be successful while helping somebody who is bringing on a $35,000 device and only has three months until they need to like move on to their next big thing. Um, and so for me, I would say it's helped me have more direct, urgent conversations. Like, is this something that's important to you? Um, why is it important now? And Quite honestly, Delaney, it's the same conversation I have with like aspects that are clients, one-on-one -on -one clients. It's like they see our paid advertisement on social media. They come in, they're sort of intrigued about trying something. And most businesses want to be like, all right, we'll get you started. It's $350 for today. I mm -hmm. hope you come back tomorrow and I'll sell you a 10 pack or five pack. Mm -hmm. You're going to be fantastic. And instead you know, what we do at our business is really get intimate with the, with our clients or our prospects problems. And we identify actually, if it's urgent enough for them and us to start. Yeah. And if it's not, it's not going to be worth their time and honestly not worth their money. And the results will therefore not be great. So quite, it's like the same, same, same vetting of the importance of time and value is in all businesses, whether it's in my B to C, my consumer business, right. clients that want cryo skin and contouring, um, as well as in, you know, B to B, which is with other businesses who are seeking services of coaching. Right. And I think a key point that you highlight here that's so important too, is that when you're vetting, you're also really looking for accountability. You're looking for commitment from the other person, from the person that's coming in, either looking to consult your services and consulting or looking to seek treatments at your facility. You know, you're looking for whether or not they're going to be able to take accountability to take your advice, your feedback, your, you know, recommendations as far as what they need to do to maintain results. If we're talking on the treatment front and if they're not, you're feeling confident enough to say, you know, this isn't the right fit because this is the type of client that I serve best and I know my value and, and the, the value of my time, which I think is something that's really important. I think it's something that a lot of entrepreneurs likely really struggle with with what advice would you give to entrepreneurs that are, or even professionals for that matter, people, even in their personal lives um, that are struggling with that idea of not that kind of scarcity mindset, right? That feeling of, oh my God, what if I say no to this opportunity? That's not quite right because I'm afraid that something else isn't going to come. I'm afraid that the right thing's not going to come. How would you give them advice to, to stay in their power and really be confident in those situations? If you don't value your own time, no one else will. So if you're going to allow people to chew your ear, text you all hours, and not pay you or not show you with some sort of currency that it's of value, then how can you ask them for something significant? You can't. So you ha it starts with you. You know, you have to start 
you know, making a lot of mistakes and start valuing your experience and valuing your time. And it goes from there. Um, in both the businesses, the B2B and the B2C in the service industry, mm -hmm. they're both similar because you're influencing somebody else's ability to have an outcome. You're not selling a phone case, a battery. We're not selling right. products that we know what happens, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. you're, you're, we're, we're encouraging and motivating and influence somebody to change their behavior for the six days that I don't see them. So the one day with the one hour we're with them changes right. throughout the entire week, right? hundred percent. Same with consulting. You're going to spend an hour of time. If you're, you should not charge for the time you charge for the outcome. So many people will say, Oh, I'll give you a, you know, a discount. Um, let's hypothetically say it's, you know, $150 for this hour call. Well, if my hour call with me is going to help you become a $30,000 a month business owner, why would I only charge you $150 for that hour? I'm not right. Right. Be the reason is, is because my time could, my one hour could generate a $30,000 business. hundred you, percent. You want that insight. You don't want me to just tell you what's, what words are wrong on your website. What, you know, you want me to educate you so you can leverage it exponentially. Um, and so if you don't value your own time, no one else will. And, and it starts there. So start, start with some like, Try it out, get rejected, learn your net niche, find out it's not 20 year old business owners, like, you know, thinking they're going to be an influencer. It might be if that's your area, it's, you, you gotta, you gotta get into the weeds a little bit to like find the, the area that you can have the most enjoyment because when you're enjoying there, it's more exponentially, you know, um, valuable. Um, and where you can have the greatest impact. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, a conversation that you and I had recently was around this idea of the infusion of fun. And so I kind of wanted to touch on that a little bit, just piggybacking off of what you just said. How do you, how do you infuse fun into business? How do you infuse fun into your life? And how do you make sure that you maintain balance across all of these things that you're doing? I'm sure it's no easy feat, but I am also sure that our listeners would love to hear some insight on that from someone who, who does have a lot of fun in, in her business. Um, absolutely. I, you know, laughter and fun is something that is more, um, contagious and more motivating than probably anything like even fulfillment there's a little bit of like even to feel f fulfilled or enjoyed but to really have fun and laugh um you want to be there like you can't even explain it to people right you're just like oh my gosh the time got away delaney and i were so giddy i don't even know about what <laughs> um right right 100 percent. so if you're going to work with people might as well have fun. And so the way I do it is like, what are the things we enjoy? What do we like? So my staff loves to like chit chat and like collaborate over meals. So to them, it's like, I'm treating them to lunch, but really we're talking about problems, challenges, best ideas, software issue, I've fix this like new um, link, um, this just we're, because we're together having fun, the conversation just flows. Um, I add treatments that are really focused on our niche, like on like time. So I decided that our, you know, when I started the business a year, 10, 10 months ago, it was all right to help women. So not everybody, women mm -hmm. um, in the middle age ish feel better about themselves. Although other people not in the business would think, wow, that's pretty specific. It's actually so broad. So then after doing that for a while, you start to look three months later, I'm like, ooh, these clients didn't do so well. These clients did really well. And what I found was, is the clients that came more regularly, twice a week, every week, um, they did better. Probably not, honestly, because of what I physically or what our team physically did, but the way we are constantly engaging with them. If you have two touch points out of 14 days, you're more likely to affect their 
12 other days where they're like sitting in front of the TV and going, oh, Delaney's going to ask me what I ate. Delaney's going to ask if I worked out. Did I do that lymphatic procedure? Um, and that right. accountability. And so also experientially too, just having those touch points in terms of being in the space to your point where there, there's fun happening, there's conversation happening, they're building relationships, they feel seen, heard, understood. I think that's a huge part of niche building is really understanding who you're serving and, and really tailoring the experience to them because you're building community whenever you're working with people. You, you just are. And especially when you're working in beauty and wellness, these are industries that are so deeply personal and are so emotional for so many people because when we seek out these services, these treatments, when we seek out these businesses, we're, we're looking to feel better. We're looking to feel better. That's the underlier. Um, you know, whether that's through looking better, feeling better, feeling better, looking better, whatever it is, you know, we want to feel better and we also want to feel seen, heard and understood. And, you know, when you're going into a location where you're feeling those things and you're experiencing that, the more that you soak up that energy, it's going to fill up your cup and you're going to be more incentivized to do the things that these people are telling you to do because you build that momentum, right? You start to build that, which I think is really important for all beauty and wellness business owners to consider as well. I would say the other thing too about having fun is also being yourself. So um, sometimes my clients will say, Cece, what, um, what type of A, B, C, D would you recommend? It's peripherally involved with what I do, but I'm like, if I'm not doing it, I'm not going to, I'm like, you know, and I am very honest, like I I can tell you what I personally think, but it really doesn't have anything to do with what I'm doing. And I don't have the credibility. So I'm going to, and I literally say to my clients, I'm going to stay in my lane mm -hmm. and I'm going to allow you to explore that lane with somebody you feel is better equipped to do that. And, and I have to say they respect that because they're like, this lane is so tight. They want me to expand my lane. And I'm like, no, we are so, we're, our lane is this. Women between 45 and 65 that don't have time and they're mm -hmm. looking for a predictable, consistent outcome. And we're going to give us one hour a week. And what can we do for their entire experience? Um, so I would say it's just be honest, right? So right. I'm, we're all very transparent. I don't require any of my colleagues to be different than they are. If they're casual and approachable and warm, I don't say come out and be very stiff and professional. For me, I'm not very, I'm a very animated person. I'm very direct. So I also am that in my professional life. Um, and it resonates and maybe it doesn't, but it will attract those it does. I think you touch on something there that's so important that I think is so impactful for so many professionals, entrepreneurs to really take on board around this idea of integrity and really being true to yourself and also being really honest if the answer is I don't know, or I'm not the right person. I'm not the right trusted advisor for this and feeling comfortable as well to defer them. Like you said, to someone who's in that lane and not feeling like you have to be the person who knows everything. And I also wanted to go back to something that you said earlier, which I find so fascinating within the context of your personal and professional journey, which is that you were always entering into spaces where you felt like you were surrounded by people that were smarter than you, that were, you know, that were above you in that way, that you were learning so much from these people. And I see you now as such an incredible guide. And I see you as having kind of got, gone into this space and developed this expertise within this niche where you are now in this situation, the smartest person in the room, you're giving that feedback from someone who has the experience, who has the expertise, who has the knowledge. And, and what has, so what has that transition felt like for you? Do you feel like it's something that was consciously cultivated or, or and developed over time? Or did you have a kind of turning point with it? Um, you know, I would love to hear your thoughts on that. I, so it's so interesting the way you put that because you see it that way, but I see myself as just a vehicle. So you see me as like the person in the room, but I'm actually just sharing an experience. 
Mm. Um, to specificity. And I'm not telling you it's going to be exactly the same, but I'm telling you, if you do it this way, I can predict the way it's going to come. And so I, 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 it's probably just that I'm, I don't, I would say the most profound thing, Delaney, is I don't need you to believe me like I used to. Mm. I would say mm. it's, that's the difference. Like I'm no longer trying to convince you to you as in anybody who's interested right. in working with me. I'm no longer interested in, it's not my, it's not my outcome. Mm -hmm. or my goal to get you to buy my thing. It is my goal to find out if your problem can be resolved mm -hmm. with great success with what we're offering. Mm -hmm. And if it isn't, I want you to get your problem resolved. And that might include, by the way, I say this every day, it might include Hand and Stone that's right behind us. It's a beautiful facility. So many of my clients are members there. It might be the where you try this out. Um, you already go somewhere for something. That is okay. You're, they're not my competition because your problem is not exactly what we're trying to resolve. And that is such a major shift, I would say, because you can feel free of the outcome. I, right. don't, I don't feel failure if you didn't choose me. I don't even feel failure if you don't get your problem solved. And I would say that is probably the most profound change in 12 months is that wow. if you see yourself as the vehicle, then you're not tied to the outcome, right? You just do the activity, just do the activity, execute the plan. And if it happens that they pay you $10,000 or they pay you zero, it's not part of, it's not your metrics you're looking for. Right. And I think also when you are so strong and resolute in these boundaries that you've set for yourself and in the way that you do your business in, you know, accepting again, wh whichever business we're talking about here in only accepting the clients that, that you know are a good fit, what you're actually doing is you're setting yourself up to start building this super fan base. You're building this advocate base, whereas in, you know, this more scarcity mindset that a lot of entrepreneurs, there's no, there's no guilt, there's no shame in it. It's, it's, it can be scary when it, it's all on you, you know, when it's your business, it's your baby, you want to bring in everybody that you can, but the issue comes with that. And I've seen this play out in business after business that I've, I've consulted with and worked with that, you know, you start to attract the wrong types of clients for you that are not the right fit, that would be better off going down the road to the other location that can offer the, the same treatment, but just in a different way. That's just more effective for what they're looking for. And there's no failure on you there. And it also creates space, not only space in terms of like space on your books, but it also creates the energetic space to bring in clients that are actually going to be more aligned for you, that are going to actually recommend you to 10 of their friends and family that are then going to recommend you to 10 of their friends and family. And then you just start to build that incredible momentum. Whereas when you're blocking your books up with just pulling in anyone and begging anyone that will come in or come to you in your business, that's where we start to get into these 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 misalignments and these these points of friction um and i would you know i always say to people and i know that this is a feeling or at least you can correct me if i'm wrong but i think this is a feeling that you share which is you would always much rather have five aligned extremely high quality clients on your books for the day than you would have 15 clients that might not be the right fit for you because at the end of the day, those five clients are going to be not only recurring, they're going to tack on, you know, an additional set of treatments. They're going to bring in all of their friends and family, you know, that it's, it's just what, that's where niche comes in. That's where boundaries come in. That's where that kind of relationship with your clientele comes in. If, um, and you, you have to think of it too, as time is this rare commodity, right? So mm -hmm. because we're in the service business, Time mm -hmm. is fixed. My time is fixed. Their time is fixed. Their client's time is fixed. If we were in the product business, it's a little, it's a little different. 
But because we're in the service business, I we can't serve everybody. And when we serve lower quality unfit, we're taking away. So it's actually the opportunity cost is actually more expensive than the potential of making the one 10, 10 client sales at a low price. You've uh-huh. wasted t- 10 hours of potentially connecting with somebody that could lead to a full month of appointments. Absolutely. And someone too, that you can build that relationship with, that you can develop a lifetime customer from, you know, that is infinitely more valuable than, than, you know, filling up those appointments with those kind of low ticket, you know, Mm -hmm. and potentially misaligned people. I also think that, you know, and this is um, something that my mentor has really hammered into me that I think is something that, you know, is it's such an obvious one, but it's such an important one is that the two most precious commodities in life, spoiler alert, neither one of them is money, (laughs) are time and energy. And time is the one that you never get back. Energy, we can, you know, we can re-energize ourselves, we can create it, we can identify what is sucking our energy, what is giving us energy. We can give more, give less, whatever that might be, but time we never get back. It's the commodity that never regenerates. And so it, I think that your, your particular dedication to your time is something that is really important for other entrepreneurs to take note of, to really listen to, and to also take a look at where are they spending their time? I mean, I loved getting a photo from you the other day where you were working while you were getting your compression boots because it's, you know, you're, you're really maximizing your time. So how are you managing your time, you know, as such a busy business owner and a mom of teenagers, just to throw that one in, in there, how do you manage your time and, you know, still have, have the opportunity to have so much fun throughout everything you do. So, you know, of course I'm not good at it. Um, It's a constant, you know, juggle. Um, You're always thinking you're doing something wrong, but you just have to set hard boundaries. That's it. So uh, my hard boundaries are like one 30 to four 30. And you need to be on fire as a client or something has to happen where you see me in person that time period. That is my thinking while driving and chauffeuring kids. That is me being ready to like be silly and over the top, excited to see my team that looks at me with like cross eyed. Um, (laughs) That is, you know, um, me driving the karaoke carpool with w- my kids and the, you know, the windows down and laughing out the window, making fools of ourselves, you know, and I'm not good at being present a hundred percent, but because I block it, I probably nail it 50% of the time. Mm-hmm. I look forward to planning something I'm like, Hey, what's going on in this time slot? Cause I'm free. It's my volunteer and casually show up at the school for whatever reason, like selling pizza today, like I do it just to be present and Mm -hmm. pretend I'm, it's like, I call it the pretend I'm a stay at home mom period. And then I'm, you know, but that's a sacrifice, right? I'm up at five 30 when my high schoolers are up, I'm already second coffee in and, you know, grinding on the computer so I can pretend I have this casual job later. You know, it, it does also lead to me driving in circles because I forget where I'm going. I'm deep in thought. (laughs) But that's a beautiful place to be. I think, you know, having so many ideas, having so much circulating, percolating for you, you know, just having such a creative mind. I know it can be exhausting from personal experience, but, you know, I think you also are speaking to something that's so important, which is we have to create time, right? We all have the same 24 hours in the day, and there's never going to be enough time, right? We're never going to feel like there's enough time. Mm. And the thing that I hear the most from people when I hear about them talking through their resistance, even me talking through my own resistance to doing the things that really light you up, that fill up your cup, that you think would advance you in your life and bring you closer to where you want to be. One of the biggest points of resistance is, is I don't have time, right? And so I think that that intentional 
creation of time, you're creating time by saying from 1.30 to 4.30, this is what I'm doing. I, I have space here because you're also creating space. And then in doing that, you're also creating energy because you're getting so um, filled up by karaoke carpool, by, you know, even if your son is looking at you cross-eyed, I'm sure it is, you know, still filling you up because you're seeing him grow and develop into this amazing young person. And that then informs the work that you do when you're grinding at 5 a.m. You know, it's, it's, it's those moments that then allow us to show up more fully in the rest of our lives. And if we don't prioritize those moments, then we, we lose out on some of that balance. So I think the word prioritize is hard, right? Because we all intend to prioritize. I think you just put it in. Mm. You don't even, cause you know, we always, I, you know, so many people talk about goals and priorities and where it focus, but it's like, just do it. And the focus and priority follows, you know, um, a lot of my, you'll, you'll see, if you look at some of my posts on our private Facebook group, where we're trying to increase engagement and help partners, I will always post something more timely than perfect. And the person and, the, and I'm trying to teach people that it's better to do it bad than to wait till it's good. Because if you wait, you wasted all this energy. And quite honestly, no one noticed it was bad. We talked about this a lot in the past few podcast episodes, actually. Um, Simon and I talked about it. I talked about it a little bit on my solo podcast episode. Um, I want to ask you on this particular point, because there is this is also Simon's big thing is done not perfect and just ship it. Ship it, action oriented, do it, send it out, post it. And that's how things get done. And I love hearing it coming from you as well. Um, as someone who does struggle with perfectionism, has struggled with perfectionism, I like to call myself a recovering perfectionist because I'm working on it. But I would love to get your perspective. And I'm sure we have other listeners that are in the same boat on how to get how to get to this point where you're just shipping, where you're just doing it, you know, and, and what would, what kind of advice would you give to people who kind of struggle in that area? Um, I would say that has been my entire year, just do it. So I think that's such a, this, this, what you just said, Delaney literally defines my entire 12 months. So when I said, all right, objectively, I can do this in order for me to serve more people in the way I want. I need to get rid of this thing, which is a full-time job mm. because with the full-time job, I could probably, let's be honest, I could probably do the job in less time better than most people, mm -hmm. but there's this background noise too. That's like carrying their problems, carrying their concerns that is creating not just my showing my up time, but also my mind space. Right. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, I knew in order for me to start something, I actually need to stop. Wow. And people don't do that. They just, add. and you just keep adding and adding and adding. And you're like, oh my gosh, I'm drowning. So I decided I need to stop and stopping. Mm -hmm. So like when I was in corporate, you know, in, in the pharmaceutical industry, one of the like coaching things that we always say is, as a, as a leader what are some of the things you like that I do? So what should I continue as a, as a leader? Mm -hmm. What are some of the things that I should start doing that you miss or you would like? And what are the things I should stop? And the stop is actually the most important because it allows for room for the other stuff. Right. So when I, so, so when I decided to stop working, that's when I was like, all right, this is kind of, this is exciting. The first thought is this is so exciting. I get to like define my day. I get to create my life. I get to tell people who I'm going to spend my time with. And there's crickets still eating. Like there's no to paycheck twice a week. There's no regular chat. There's no, it's crickets because it's like, all right. It's like, I kind of think of starting your business. Like I'm not creative in the artistic sense like you are. But I think of like being an entrepreneur as being like an artist, like you can see it. It's so abstract because it doesn't exist, yes. but, but yet I have to make it come to life in real life. Um, and so, I, so then I was like, all right, what do I need to do? And um, I'm like, all right, I need to create content. 
Mm -hmm. So I can create content so that way people can see. And I was like, you know what? Why don't I write a book? I'm going to write a book that tells people what to do. So that way they can get my time without me sitting here captive for two hours or an hour of my time. And I can help more people. And they're like, how am I going to pay for that book? I need a client. I need, I need, I need, how am I going to pay for the book? There's not like a money tree, like my, <laughs> so you, do you see what I'm saying? My point is, is it just, you just start and you work backwards. So yeah. instead of, so instead of saying, oh, I'd like to get money, which is what everybody, every client prospect is like, I'd like to get money so I can pay my bills. It's like, all right, what is my goal? How do I get there? What do I have to do? Oh, okay. And you just go back. So then I, you know, I was like, all right, this is a sip publishing and writing a book is, is a lot of time and effort. Even if you hire, you know, a company to help guide you through it. Absolutely. Um, so I was like, all right, then you start like, Oh, Robert, the, that's when you start getting very, like, it's no longer like, Oh, I'm going to have this beautiful business and people will come. It's like, all right, I need a client. What are my specific services and what, who is that client? And then that's when I'm like, all right, I got to go find people that fit this profile that mm -hmm. I can serve. And, and I did, I found a spa that's not far from my, from where I live. Mm -hmm. And I happened to know people there and I was, and people like it. It's a wellness center. I was like, all right, let me go check this out. Mm -hmm. And, and I, you know, was able to strike an arrangement where I would help them. And, um, and that was my first client. Then my second client was my prior employer saying, hey, you know what, would you mind doing this on a retainer? And so now I'm like, ooh, if I do this for mm -hmm. 12 months, mm -hmm. I can pay for that book that will publish either, it could have published sooner, and then as you build it, if you're like, it'll cover its, you know, the scope of work over a year to build mm -hmm. this. So, all right, that's how you kind of, that's how I started that. And then as I'm writing the book, I'm like, you know what would make sense is if I show people how to do this, let me just show them. Because if I tell you, you know, if I tell you, well, in order for you to create a brand position, you really need to know what, what experience you're going to offer and what people you want to serve. It's so vague. It's so right. like, no, I mean, unless you're like me from brand management, you don't even know where to right. start. And so I was like, all right, you know, I'm going to just go out and do it. And mid, and so it was like three weeks later, I'm getting a device. And I'm like, all right, I have no customers. I don't even have a place of business. I'm going to go find a hairstylist that I know or will know or a business in the area. And I'm going to do a demo day. I don't even have a rent arrangement. I'm just like showing up. And I just recorded it. We're going to do an unboxing event at, you know, this salon in town. And you get to watch me fail publicly. I didn't have a Facebook page. <laughs> I didn't have an Instagram page. I was like, all right, so if I'm going to have this unboxing thing in a week, I probably need to have a place for people to visit and learn. I better create an Instagram page. I better create a Facebook page. I probably need to create a Google My Business page. And then you just work. So you set a goal and then you find the steps to get there. And you, you know, and then you have a deadline. And you have to deliver. And you have to deliver. So you just accomplish that. You throw the event. You get people awareness. People come. People don't come. And, you're, and you just move from the next step. All right. So then now I need a place of business. Then I need clients. Now I should do some organic marketing. I should do some referral marketing. Mm -hmm. Meet people. Get out and meet people. Have conversations. Be humble enough to say, hey, I'm doing this. This is kind of weird and scary. And, and literally just ha like tell people. You know? I mean... Um, and then I did the organic approach, did 100% of my treatments. I invited people to see. And as they saw, it was they were able to see what I'm offering. And then they're like, can I work here? And, and it just goes from there, you know? And then you, do, then you just evolve in your business. All right, I nailed this organic marketing. I've got some great content, recorded testimonies. Now I need to move. I know trajectory is now I need to do paid ads. So now I'm going to move on to paid ads. And at every step, it's scarier because your investment is so much bigger mm. and your risk is actually bigger. Of course. Um, so when I, 
I would say that I encourage failure. Like I plan for failure, right? Like I create the fan. I know it's scary and I need to be desensitized by the fear. Mm-hmm. I love that approach. I think that's such a helpful set of tangible tools that people can use. I think especially when you make the commitment, I think that that is when you commit to something and you put it out there and you say, this is launching on this day and this is happening, then it is such a fire lit under the ass. And it is just something where you, you get it done. You get it done. Because I do think that for those that are perfectionists, you know, especially when talking about doing these things that feel like big leaps and often when we are not taking these big leaps that we really want to take, that we have this desire for, this hunger for, that we feel we can really be offering our unique gifts and skill set to the world in a way that is going to be more fulfilling for us and also be of better service to the rest of the world. You know, we are feeling that resistance because of these these beliefs that we have about ourselves or about failure or about success or oh my god what are people going to think are they am, are they going to think i'm stupid are they going to laugh at me am i good enough am i this am i that and then just shedding all of that away or even just allowing the noise to be there but just turning down the volume on it a little bit and saying okay it's okay you know, we were launching on this day. So let's get ready. You know, what do we got to do? And I think to your point, you know, it's something that Kate, our CEO says all the time, but it's the starting with the end in mind, right? It's, it's having the end in Mm -hmm. mind and then it's going through the action steps that you need to take to get there, which I think is, is so, so, so important. What do you attribute your confidence to? What do you attribute? Have you always been someone who's been incredibly confident? Because, you know, you have demonstrated throughout your story, and it's been so incredible to hear parts of it that I've I've known before, but parts of it that I I had no idea about. What do you attribute this this confidence to? Um, You know, I, I love the connection point of your previous experience in pharmaceuticals being so outcomes driven, being so driven by these proven methodologies, by these proven, you know, uh, medications, by these proven treatments and therapeutics and how that's kind of transmuted into your business now and how you approach things. But you're so incredibly confident. And where does that come from for you? Is it something that's natural? Is it something that's built, born? Where does it come from? How can our listeners cultivate it for themselves? This is so hysterical because you see that, but I would never describe myself that way. And the same goes for you because I see you as so polished and gorgeous and makes perfection look simple. So to that point, you know, I would say your perception of my confidence is that I'm still here. Like I put myself in environments where I'm probably the dumbest person in the room and I survived without getting laughed at. I tried a post on social media saying I'm going to do this event and figured it out. And did it make a million bucks? No, but I survived. So I would say data. You, Everyone needs data. And the only way you get data is by repetition. The mm-hmm. only way you get repetition is by doing it over and over. And then you're numb. You don't even have time to think about it. Like that negative thought doesn't even have time to like occupy your concerns because right. you got a deadline, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, you um, got work. You got work to do. I mean, when there's work to do, the <laughs> Thoughts have no place, but it's so interesting to your, your point about repetition, because that's how we do things like build new habits. That's how we do things like shed old habits. That's how we do, that's how we create change. Repetition creates momentum, momentum creates energy, energy creates change. So, you know, your question around confidence. And I said, um, I, the secret to building confidence is by having data experiences, like hard data. And data doesn't necessarily just mean like studies, it's experiences and having done similar experiences over and over, creating repetition. So some of the things that I would do, so when I'm coaching somebody and I know, you know, early on in the conversation, we ask them, what are you currently doing and what are your current outcomes and what are your goals and how far is that gap? What have you tried? 
And mm -hmm. so by having that specific conversation with them, you're able to see whether or not they're not doing anything and hoping for outcomes, right? There's that is realistic. They're spending a lot of money. These are just like common problems I hear. They're spending a lot of money expecting somebody else to have the passion and the conversion that they would, but they're totally autonomous to what the other person is doing, but they're holding them accountable. So then we'll talk, you know, um, the other one is fear because they're just not sure where to start. They're overwhelmed. So I would always coach them and consult with them on creating repetition of failure immediately. And so one of the things that, so in certain cases, most business owners, right? Like, for example, let's talk about Facebook ads because, or social media ads, because it's so important. Even though no one likes to say they're on Facebook, everyone is there to, it's like the encyclopedia or Wikipedia. People just go on Facebook to search something. Mm -hmm. It's where your Facebook groups are. It's where like your events are. But, you know, unless you're like me, you're not a sharer, in, in, you know, for most people. And they really are just looking to view. Right. So people are scared to be there. They're like, well, and so what, one, some of the things that I'll question a lot is like, if you're in the beauty industry and it's important that your brand is there, you should personally be there too. Because if you want your professional world to be completely credible, mm -hmm. it needs to match your personality. Mm -hmm. And yes. you can spot the businesses who are like, I do $10,000 of paid ads, but I am never on paid ads, social. That's not a, it's not necessarily bad. It's just so much more potential when it's synchronized and consistent and trustworthy, right? So I would encourage them to like make posts, create mm -hmm. a LinkedIn, create posts. And they're like, well, what would I say? I go, no one's listening to you. You have zero followers. Say whatever you want. Find your voice. Get yeah. comfortable just with your fear. Like literally you have two followers. You just started your business. No one's, there's no one here. Right, right. No, it's so interesting. And it's it's something, you've said a couple of things that I want to highlight on in, in, in talking about that, but you know, that particular piece of just starting and just starting it, um, Seth Godin, who's just an amazing, you know, amazing author, amazing, particularly in the realm of marketing, but just an, an amazing person to reference for anyone. Um, but he has something that he talks about where he just literally started writing a blog post every single day and nobody was reading them. And he just committed to doing it every single day, which is going back on that repetition piece, right? Repetition builds momentum, momentum builds energy, energy builds change. And when we want to change anything in our life, whether it's habits, whether we want to build new habits, drop old habits, it's the repetition. It's that discipline of going out and, and just putting yourself out there and in business, in your professional life, in your personal life, just putting yourself out there is so important because that's how opportunities are able to find you. If you're not putting yourself out there, nothing's going to be able to find you because you're not, you're not there. But people don't want to put themselves out there, but then they expect people to pay them for their time. Mm. Right. So how can I pay you to teach me something you don't do? I see it every day in the industry. People are happy to do so, but it's not sustainable. Um, so if that's their, if that's their roadblock, then I will encourage them to take tasks that are breaking down that fear and it could be so small, it could literally be like, you don't even have followers on LinkedIn. You don't even have any followers on Instagram. Get comfortable talking to your future audience, the clients you think have this problem. Mm -hmm. figure it out and then see what resonates with you. Um, another thing with the Facebook ads is, is, you know, it's, it's a totally different process when people are looking for you and then they find you and they want to come in because you're advertising versus an organic lead. They're so different and they should be handled differently. So when I went from like doing organic advertising, which is basically like demonstrations, events, people, friends of friends, um, and doing things in the community to find people. Then you move to paid ads and I'm like, all right, I had this pivotal moment where I was like, I could do these consultations, but that's not sustainable. If I'm running a business that's potentially 50% consulting and 50% treatment, I need my staff to do this. So I actually mm -hmm. paid them to fail. I was like, all right, look, we are going to start doing consultations and you're going to be pretty terrible at it, but I'm going to pay you for the activity, not for the outcome. Mm. 
Mm, it was an expensive month. It was such an expensive month. I, am, I can imagine. <laughs> because I was paying them. And so other businesses would look at it the opposite. They would go, all right, I'm already paying for these leads. They cost me $5,000 a month for advertising leads. I want them to be handled really well. And I was like, all right, I'm going to eat this expense for a month because it is going to teach my team skills that will sustain them for the next, hopefully two years or till the next campaign, we, you know, our next market initiative. And so I had them, I had a contest and I was like, all right, we're going to do some consultations and you're going to just do a lot of consultation. I don't even care who it is, but whoever has the most people booked for these consultations will get them. And, and I sold the consultations for $30. Mm-hmm. So in $30, you get a treatment and a consultation and whatever the money was, I think it was probably a couple thousand dollars. I was like, the person who did the most is going to get the entire pot. And then you all get paid for your treatments. So it was expensive but I considered it like training. Right. A hundred percent. And I think you raised something so important here for anyone who, you know, is running a business, even a professional is managing people. It's all about keeping the long-term vision as that, just that, that North star for you, because you took a short-term hit, right? In the short term, that was a hit that you took. You took the hit, you had to take that loss, but you did it because of the long-term investment in your team's development, the long-term investment in getting your time back and being able to really trust that you're not only creating this development opportunity for your team, that's building that culture, that's helping with that retention, that's creating, you know, their camaraderie as well, you know, that healthy competition, Mm -hmm. but it's just something that is really important. And I do also see a lot of businesses struggling with this when they're just looking at the short term right in front of them. You know, it's, it's really knowing your long-term vision, knowing what it is that you want to achieve and just going for it. Yeah. Um, it was, it was really fun because I kind of called it like learning in a Petri dish. I was like, all right, you guys are going to learn what most people learn in three years in probably through like three weeks. And you're going to be, you're going to be so beat up because you're going to have your mom coming in for a treatment. She's going to challenge you up and down. You're going to have like, you know, these paid ad people coming in Mm -hmm. and you're going to realize that like doing a, cause I wanted also to teach them doing a single treatment is never going to convert. That was also the thing. So I wanted them to learn that doing things cheaper and a one and done as well as advertising Mm -hmm. um, and discounting like discounting and converting. It's just, it's just not sustainable. So I could tell them, but I was like, you know what? I want you to tell me. Trial by fire, baby. It's the best way to go. I mean, honestly, when you're on your feet, when you're in the room, when you're learning these lessons and to your point about you desensitizing yourself from failure, it also helps your team to develop that same skin where they're learning on their feet. I mean, I, could not even count on my hands or feet or, you know, probably 20 other people's hands and feet, the amount of lessons that I have learned being in this industry for the past eight years and the amount of times that I've fallen on my face, the amount of times I've fallen on my ass and have gotten back up and have been so much better for it. So I've been so grateful for those opportunities, for the people who have given me those opportunities to grow and to develop. And, you know, I think that it it does give you this amazing perspective perspective to to see again the data where you look back and you say actually I've I've overcome 100% of the things that I've failed at or that I've you know not done good enough or well enough or whatever that might be and it's and- that metrics though right like why mm-hmm. is it the way we feel the metrics and what we think other people think so if I that I, that's the confidence part Delaney for mm-hmm. both of us right it's like instead of saying like oh Delaney thinks I did a good job right no I have proof that I did something difficult and I survived yeah that's simple my metrics is not to be better than somebody else. My metrics is not to make a million dollars. My metrics was a very high bar Mm -hmm. that I could learn through. And then therefore I'm like, Oh, look at that. I didn't like win, but Hey, I survived. And I think I survived is such a powerful 
sentiment and such a powerful thing to to tap into and to feel it's the resiliency advantage it's you know which is an amazing book by the way if anyone wants to read that but it is um it really is it's about this resilience piece of i survived i survived i kept going i kept getting back up i didn't give up you know and it that's a really powerful thing when we look at adversity is something that is always going to be there. We're never going to get to a point where we have achieved enough success or enough, you know, personal growth that adversity mm-hmm. doesn't come. It's it's always going to be there. It's just about how we're able to work with it, how we're able to respond to it, how we're able to learn from it. I am wary that we just have a few minutes left and I am so appreciative of the time that you've given to the podcast. I think this episode is going to help so many listeners and viewers and hopefully inspire some people in hearing about your journey. We do have one last question that we asked to all of our guests on the show because the answers are always really interesting and very diverse. We want to know here at Glow and Tell what beauty and wellness mean to you personally. So to me, um, they're kind of the same, probably the, um, one leads to the other and they, and vice versa. So, you know, I started when I promoted my coaching or in consulting business, I was saying beauty or wellness providers. And then they're actually the same person, right? Because mm-hmm. when you treat somebody who thinks beauty is the their goal or mm-hmm. their nemesis, they're not well. Mm-hmm. Um, but yet when they refrain from thinking about other people's view of beauty, they are well. I would like to say though, one last thought in closing is that the hard work you do has significant dividends in self-love and self-fulfillment. Because if you're strict about your boundaries, you restrict the people who have access that you can help, you're going to love what you do every day. And it doesn't matter how much they pay you or when the day ends, because it'll be your life work. And that is so much more meaningful than just creating a business, but having an impact on people who make the world better. And it's so much fun when you surround yourself with people you can guarantee you can help. Love that answer and is very much aligned with my personal feelings about both as well. So it's so funny to always see how everyone has such a different approach and sentiment on those two topics. I think that that's just such a fantastic point for us to finish off on for sure. Thank you so much again, Stacey, for joining the podcast. We hope to see you on a future episode. Goodbye, listeners, and I will see you back here soon. Thank you. Take care. Thank you for listening to Glow and Tell. Please like, subscribe, comment, and follow anywhere where you listen to podcasts. We'll see you next time.